Okie dokie. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining who are already here. We'll give it about another minute to allow any late arrivers to come. And then I'll start the instruction and the webinar will get going. Thank you. I'd say we can even allow a couple of minutes, maybe two or even three. We're really trying to pad that hour. Right. You know, I, I see people coming in and I don't want anybody to be, feel like they're left out. So before we start with the instruction, why don't you show them your big blue head? Uh, I think your mic cut out. My big blue head, the one in real life? Yes. Sure, I'll just uh, put that on and uh, not scare anybody off that way. Blue head. Just... And this was 3D printed at his lab. I'm gonna give the presentation now. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's a good idea. A little scratchy. It's uh, definitely biomedical engineering related, uh, related to my new idea for personal protective equipment that lets people see your face and not just a big blue head that I made for no reason. I love it. In times of COVID, when everyone has to wear a mask, this is perfect. I think it's a great idea. I think this is my million dollar idea. It's just <laughs> everybody should wear one of these all the time. Okay, um, so thank you everyone for joining us. Um, this is Aron. He has a bachelor's in biochemistry from Michigan State, a master's in biomedical engineering from Lawrence Tech. He's studied abroad at the Foreign Language Institute in Beijing, and he's been a visiting fellow at the Hebrew Institute in Jerusalem. He also currently works at a, as a adjunct professor at Lawrence Tech and he's a Python instructor at Michigan Youth Empowerment Foundation. So with that, Haran, go ahead and take it over. All right, well, thank you for that introduction, Ryan. So yeah, let me just start sharing my screen here. And so yeah, today I will be talking to you about the topic of micro 3D photography on a budget. And this is one of my first rigs uh, that I made. It's a four axis um, motorized uh, digital microscope. It costs about $50 to make. And the core construction of it is actually made out of old recycled Blu-ray players, as we will learn in this talk. So a little bit about me. Uh, we just saw, most of you just saw my 3D printed head PPE prototype. That was definitely not just a Halloween costume. Um, but I started in research, uh, I studied lipid droplets. So these are organelles in your cells that are responsible for storing fat, but they're kind of um, forgotten organelles. So they're very important uh, for your health. Um, this made me study uh, biochemistry at Michigan State. Um, as Ryan said, I studied nematode chemotaxis behavior uh, at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And this is actually watching many uh, individual organisms uh, leave a food source. So studying what makes them decide that a food source is good to leave versus to stay for a long time or not. Um, and then this inspired me to work with imaging, which is what I've been doing uh, during my master's degree um, at LTU. And then now I'm at LTU again, uh, kind of as a temporary adjunct, uh, recruiting my own high school interns. So the cycle has, you know, begin anew. Um, and uh, here's a little fun fact about me is that my dad got my name and my birthday wrong in my birth certificate. So if anybody's ever had trouble pronouncing your name or if somebody forgot your birthday, don't worry, my dad did both of those and I wasn't even 24 hours old. So who's this presentation for? Um, it's for anybody who likes to look at, you know, pretty pictures of things close up. Um, but specifically, it's for people who want to look at both big and small things in a lot of detail. And what I mean by that is uh, I'm going to show you a motorized, uh, several motorized rigs that take pictures of things close up, just like a microscope does. But it's not constrained to look at a very small piece of the object at once. So, you know, as you know, when you look at things um, close up, you can only look at a small part of that at once. You know, you have a limited field of view. And so this talk is about really extending your field of view and your depth of field so that you could look at a large object in the same amount of detail as a small one. 
It's also for you if uh, you're a collector of broken electronics. So if you, you know, go out on trash day and you say, I'm going to go uh, curb shopping, as my mom calls it, then this is for you. And especially, this is the most important one, is if uh, these first two features, um, you know, these are for you, but you don't have a lot of money. So if you do have a lot of money, then you can go and buy a Kiens microscope or a Hyrox digital microscope, which can do everything I can and more. You're just going to spend, you know, $50,000, $100,000. Um, and if that's not a lot of money to you, you can do that. Or I guess you can, you know, see me after class. So here's a very brief problem overview. Um, you know, as I said, when you zoom into an object, um, if you've ever used a microscope or a, a macro camera, uh, depth of field decreases as you zoom in, and so does field of view. Um, and you can mitigate this problem with you know, really expensive optics. You, know, you can get wide field views, you can get uh, extended depth of field uh, lenses, um, and it gets very expensive very quickly, but you can never really mitigate the problem. You're talking about like a 50% increase in depth of field or a 50% increase in field of view. You're not talking about you know, a 10,000% increase. And so my solution here is to avoid the problem entirely. And it's not, you know, a totally novel solution, but to avoid the problem entirely, you physically scan across the object using motors. So you use a combination of motors to take pictures of your object from all sides, and then you throw it into some magic software. There's a lot of it out there. There's some I made myself, but there's a lot of good free open source um, uh, image stitching software out there too. And then you combine all these images and you get a large field of view. And then as a bonus, um, you might be surprised, you can actually get really good results with cheap hardware. So uh, if you have cheap lenses, um, if you probably know that the um, center of a lens is the most uh, undistorted part. And this is true for even you know, cheap uh, mass produced lenses. So you can use cheap mass produced lenses um, and just use the best part of each image. And then similarly, you can use um, kind of relatively cheap motors uh, and you can compensate for slop or mechanical backlash in software too. And then this image just kind of shows this general process, a uh, very simplified process for um, this wasp that I found in a swimming pool. Um, and then this is a really low quality image uh, version of that, but you have many small images that you uh, take. None of them cover the whole object, um, but then you just combine them into software and you get a whole image. So where do we get these motors? Uh, you can get the motors from you know a lot of places. You can buy them. Uh, you can scrounge for them. Uh, and in this case, I scrounged for them. So optical disk drives like CD players, DVD players, or Blu-ray players, by now you've probably you know, thrown them out or you've seen people throw them out. Um, they're basically considered trash, but there's actually like a treasure trove of electronics and optics inside them. Uh, so they have good lenses, they have good motors, they have good frames and everything. And so in this case, I started this project. Um, I took these optical disk drives and the part that normally held the laser assembly for scanning the disk, I just 3D printed these little attachments for a camera, a USB microscope, a slide, a Petri dish, and various other attachments um, to them so that I could move uh, linearly. Um, I could move like a camera or, a, you know, a stage, you know, in the X direction or the Y direction. And then you just combine two of these, you put them perpendicular to each other, and you get this two axis scanning rig. So here's a $12 USB microscope, very cheap. You can get this from Amazon or eBay. They're all pretty much the same. Um, and then here's a holder for a um, a three centimeter petri dish, and you can see a top view of um, you know the component that holds the uh, the camera, and you can see that you know this whole setup is really designed for three D printing. So it's not like I designed this to be exactly what I want, and then I tried to three D print it. 
I designed this from the get-go to be easy to 3D print. Um, there's no overhangs. Um, everything is really made out of simple shapes. And the whole uh, construction is meant for a snap fit too. So I like you know hearing the satisfying click as you put parts together and it saves on screws. So here's an example image um, using just this two axis setup. Here is a whole butterfly that I just literally plonked onto a stage. I think I used a little bit of tape to keep it steady. And I scanned this whole surface and this, this whole uh, surface is I think about 30 or 40 megapixels. Um, and then the original pictures that I used to, to that I put together, they were 0 0.3 megapixels. So very, very low resolution camera. But what you can see is pretty good detail. So you can see the scales, you can see the hair. And so you basically get the resolution of this cheap microscope. You get the maximum magnification, but you get it over a large field of view. And that field of view becomes unlimited. It's constrained only by your mechanical bounds. So you know how um, wide your motors can move and not at all by the camera's field of view itself. And uh, by the way, I apologize if these images aren't um, you know, perfectly clear. Uh, they're pretty good from my end, but you know, we're on Zoom and um, you know, we're giving this presentation in real, real time. So I apologize for that. I'm very happy to show you some of the originals later if you're interested. Uh, here's another example of um, using this USB microscope um, and these DVD player, these Blu-ray player motors to do the scanning. So this is a stink bug I found on my windowsill, I believe. And I had the idea, you know, if you can stitch using software, um, if you can stitch using, um, you know, mechanical scanning, then why can't you just do that by hand? And so I tried that. I used, this is actually the first image I took um, that I, I stitched together. I tried just using this digital microscope and taking pictures by hand of this insect and then stitching them together. And I thought, oh, that's pretty good. And then I did it using this automated scanning. And it's just, it's just, you know, you can't, you can't compare. It's so much better. Um, everything's clear, you know, nice and shiny. Um, and so just adding that, you know, automatic motorization, taking away that human element, you're shaking, you're not in focus, uh, you can really just get much better images. And so, you know, I did say this is about 3D microphotography and you can't say it's 3D unless you can, you know, actually see um, many views of the object or at least, you know, focus up and down, get that Z-axis uh, component. And so I actually got this Z-axis motor, this linear motor from inside the disk drive pickup unit. So inside the Blu-ray player, there's a little linear motor that's used to move one of the lenses back and forth. And this is used to switch uh, between layers when you have a multi-layer Blu-ray disc. And so I just popped out the lens and I threw in this, um, this blue um, component and originally I said, I'm gonna move a cover slip up and down. I was trying to do imaging of uh, cells, time-lapse views inside of an incubator because this rig is so small, it can fit in there. And then I said, you know, why not just try to lift an entire fourth motor? And so that's what I did, this uh, one that has a little bit of orange, I wish it would stay still, but it has a little bit of orange on it. This is a additional motor that then rotates the object. And so now you have that, you know, back and forth, forward and back, up and down, and you have that rotation capability to see all sides of a small object like an insect. And incidentally, this whole um, project, not just this part, was designed 100% in Tinkercad. So if you're not aware, Tinkercad is kind of like the Legos of 3D modeling. It's meant for children, meant to be very easy. So if you do decide to work on this project or, you know, build one yourself, um, rest assured, even if you're not uh, familiar with computer-aided design, uh, you can do this, okay? So I, I teach nine-year-olds how to do this, so you can do it. Here's just a little video, a little snippet of a video um, uh, on this project showing the Z-axis moving up and down. 
Uh, here's a, a view of the whole, uh, the whole microscope, the whole assembled setup. So you've got your camera, you've got your, um, your sample moving back and forth. And then I'm even using the original Blu-ray player. Uh, it has um, a laser in it. It has three lasers, actually, uh, for reading the disc. And I am using the original laser to provide backlight capability. So I can shine light through this hole and I can illuminate my sample from behind if you're looking at something transparent or if you want to um, mask an opaque object. So if you want to create a shadow of it, you can do that with this setup. And then here we have all of our axes moving together in unison. Let's try that again. It's gonna do that a couple of times so we can see that everything's working together. And once again, this is made entirely out of uh, uh, Blu-ray players and a USB microscope. So here's an example of once you have that 3D capability um, that you can do 3D imaging. And so here's that wasp from before. I'm probably the only person to ever hot glue a wasp to a, a 3D printed mounting piece. Now I use a needle, but at the very beginning, I was impatient and I said, you know, how can I get this on here? And I said, you know, hot glue, that'll work. Uh, and so we did our 2D scan before where we had many small pictures that we combined together. And now we're just doing that multiple times. So we're not doing anything different. We're still doing our 2D scanning, but we are rotating our object a little bit each time. And we're just doing this many times over and over. So this is 2D scanning repeatedly to get our object to be a three-dimensional view. Here are some more examples of uh, you know, insects I scan. Um, so all of these were actually found dead already um, in swimming pools or window sills or just outside except for this one in the middle, which is a Japanese beetle, which is invasive here uh, where I live. Um, and you can see kind of actually, you know, on right and the left, I'm using this kind of, uh, I'm using this um, hot and glue to stick them on. I'm actually, they, this one's dirty on purpose. I tried to use um, a pattern. I tried to make a, a pattern on it with a, a marker. So it would make it easier to like track which position it is. I didn't work so well. So here we just have a clean version and then the needle going right through the bug uh, so that we can rotate it and scan it. And then once again, all of these are 2D scanned images. So these are not like a camera looking at the whole object at once. Uh, all of these images are stitched images from uh, doing that grid pattern uh, scan. So, you know, it wouldn't be, I did say the talk was about 3D photography, but people often think, oh, 3D photography, 3D scanning, they're the same. Um, they're not quite the same. When you want to 3D scan something, you have to actually convert it into a mesh. You have to convert it into a 3D object. Uh, and so that is possible. So this is just a little GIF showing you um, the process starting from these, um, you know, there's a bug on my finger. And then here we have the bug rotating and being scanned. And then here's the actual three-dimensional uh, rendering of it. And so this is possible, you know, clearly I've done it, um, but it's not really optimized for standard photogrammetry. Um, and photogrammetry is the technique of taking many pictures uh, from different viewpoints of an object and then combining that into a three-dimensional uh, object. Um, but it's not optimized for it because the technique assumes that you have a stationary object and then a camera that moves around it. And here we have both a moving object and a moving camera. And then the object is also stitched from many individual images. So it's not really optimized for it, but I'll show you in a little bit that even though it's not optimized for it, there's tricks you can do that actually take advantage of the physical construction of this scanner. Um, and what I mean by that is rather than blindly taking pictures and then turning them into an object, we're going to use the information we actually know about our object and its position 
because we're using motors to move everything, we're going to use that motor positional information to generate our three-dimensional scan. And uh, if you do want to see some of these uh, you know, scans and manipulate them, here's a link. Um, and then I'll also provide a link to all of my, uh, all of my work uh, at the end of the day. So I did say that this is, uh, you know, it's kind of how to, um, it's really not how to this specific guide. Uh, you know, we don't really have enough time to go over, you know, the construction of the scanner, you know, like the computer it uses, the wiring. Um, but I did uh, have all of, I do have all of this in excruciating detail here on Instructables. So my device, I call it Ladybug. That's just because I think we, uh, you know, when I was working on it at the beginning, I was scanning insects and I gave it the name Ladybug. And if you just type in uh, ladybug scanner or ladybug microscope, you'll find this Instructables guide um, that details exactly how to make this Blu-ray player version in excruciating detail from which Blu-ray players you need, which drivers you need, how to process your 3D prints, and so on. So I think I'm going actually a little too fast. We're probably going to end in about 40 minutes, not an hour. Um, that's okay. Um, but here we have, um, you know, I've just been talking about this Blu-ray player version um, that's made out of Blu-ray players and a cheap USB microscope. But I, I really kind of wanted to be able to scan larger things and have a sturdier system. And so actually uh, this 3D printer, which is in my lab, it actually, um, it's right over there. Um, I'm sure if you can see this uh, red one over here. Um, and that's, that's this right there. Uh, and I broke it. I was uh, repairing a fan, uh, so just a, a small component, and I had it on, and then I suddenly heard, you know, pop, and it started to smoke, and um, it was totally dead. The main board was totally fried. And so what I did was I just connected to the existing motors. You know, everything was still good, mechanically speaking. And I, I connected to these existing motors with these motor drivers um, and a Raspberry Pi. And it's actually very similar to the Blu-ray version. I'm just using an existing mechanical setup, which is frankly orders of magnitude better than you know, what I built the first time. And then just like that, you plonk in uh, a USB microscope and you do scans. Here's a short video showing the progression uh, of this scanner is that I added a fifth rotational axis. And then it's showing you um, that, you know, I did a little bit of math work to, if you're rotating, if you're tilting the object to be able to figure out where you should be moving your microscope and your stage so that the object remains in focus. So if you can imagine when you rotate your object, you know, you're suddenly you're, you know, like an inch or, uh, or so above where you where you started. Uh, and you have to move your camera and everything to be able to stay in focus. And so truthfully, I haven't really worked on this too much. Um, I was working on this in February of 2020. And uh, February and March of 2020 were totally normal, you know, months, nothing special happened. I just decided to stop working on this and decided to stop coming to the lab for no reason at all. Um, but I would like to, uh, to start working on this sometime again um, and really develop it fully. Uh, there's a lot of good information, especially from CNC operators. So they deal with problems like the offset I was talking about all the time. Um, and so I would like to really use this existing um, you know, literature and existing knowledge to improve upon this setup. But like I said, you've got a fifth axis set up, not just four, but a fifth tilt, a tilt axis too, and you can really fly around your object. Uh, up until now, I've only shown you manipulation of the object and then uh, 2D scanning and rotation, um, but you do have that Z axis control, so you can also do stacking. So here's an example of just stacking in one image. So this is just one small image, and you have, uh, this is a ballpoint pen tip. So, you know, pretty small. And uh, here's an animation showing the stacking process where you have only, in each frame, you only have a very small amount of the object in focus, but, you know, it's pretty trivial nowadays to stack um, images. There's plenty of software available. This one's PicoLay, 
uh, it's available for free. Um, and so you can extend your depth of field by mechanically moving your object, taking many pictures, and then combining them together. And then you can use this to also generate a depth map, for instance, so you can visualize that 3D information. Finally, we get to a biomedical application. Uh, so this is actually doing a scan of an osseodensification drill bit. So when they, uh, when they excavate the tooth, if they're going to put in a crown uh, for dentistry, um, what they used to do was they would cut away uh, bone to widen the hole so that they could put the crown in. Um, but nowadays, um, you know, a pretty smart dentist, he figured out that instead of cutting away old bone, you can actually you compact the bone and you can uh, widen the hole by squishing the bone and densifying it. Um, and then this results in better, uh, better outcomes. You save that good bone. And so I'm just showing you in this video, I'm manipulating one of these drill bits um, uh, with really terrible, uh, you know, holding my cell phone camera pretty badly, but I'm just manipulating this drill bit. I'm focusing in and out. I'm, you know, moving around. I'm uh, really bad at holding the camera steady. And then I'm, you know, rotating and tilting so that you can see every detail you want. That's just manual inspection. And then I show you that you can also do this rotational, you know, taking many images. I just skip over here. And then the Z stack as well. That's this image over here. It's actually not a great Z stack. I'm showing you in PicoLay, just this process that you can do. Again, all free software. And then finally, I'm showing you the 2D scan. So I'm taking many, many images um, of the object of one surface, still using this you know, camera, this entry-level camera that has a very low resolution. I'm stitching it together. And then you can see that you know, you've got this large view of the whole bit. And then it tells you to, to subscribe to me on YouTube, which you should totally do. Maybe I'll get to 120 subscribers. So now that we've shown that we can do both uh, stacking and stitching separately, um, I've started to combine the two. So once again, these are um, relatively low quality GIFs because I can't really fit anything too big on this uh, presentation. But here we have relatively large objects where we can zoom in real, real, real close and we can get that whole view of the object too. So we get the best of both worlds. We have a large field of view. We have, the, um, we have a large field of view. We have high resolution, what we're looking at and everything is in focus. So I guess that's three worlds. So, you know, we have this, you know, this, you know, this uh, RAM chip and we can get all the way into looking at the, you know, the flakes of solder on the individual surface mounted components. Here's a more recent scan. I'm always trying to find applications for this. And I haven't shown you, you know, most of the pictures I've taken, um, but here's an application, you know, I'm always thinking like maybe archeology, span um, you know, archiving, um, just anything where you need a huge amount of detail over a large area. And so here I'm zooming in, this is an old Roman coin. And we can actually see when we are zoomed in, again, I wish we would say still, is we can actually see the multiple strikes of the person who did this like 2000 years ago, uh, when they did these coins, they would hit it multiple times and we can actually see the multiple lines on this V, which I think is pretty incredible. And then we can zoom out and we can see the whole object. So I teased earlier that we would be able to make 3D uh, maps 
um, 3D renderings just using um, the mechanical positioning information. And uh, that's what we have here. So this is the coin that I just showed you, this Roman coin. And here we have a depth map, a prof kind of a profile lometry type depth map showing um, you know, the surface geometry of this uh, coin where white is closer to you and black is further away. And this is generated entirely, you know, in my software. Again, everything's open source. So I'll show you where to, where to download it. Um, and this is generated entirely in that based on the, uh, the pixel size. So at a certain resolution, a certain magnification, you know how many pixels per millimeter you have. It's using that information and then it's just using the mechanical information. So um, it says I, I moved you know, to this location and then I moved to this location. And then it's finally, it's using the focus information. And how it's doing that is I've taken you know, pictures over many Z heights and then I stacked them. And when I stacked them, I said, you know, remember which pixel that was in focus came from which Z height. And then I just combine those all into a depth map. And then if you want, it kind of looks like a cookie, doesn't it? When then if you want, uh, you can 3D print this out just like any other 3D model or actually this is just the image, you can 3D print this out by pretending it's a lithophane. And a lithophane is just a printable photograph. So most uh, 3D slicing programs uh, will support putting images in here. And if you put a depth map in, you can um, 3D print this out uh, pretty easily actually. And you can get pretty good uh, detail. And uh, by the way, this is actually, um, this is part of my attempts to 3D print in metal. So I'll show you, uh, maybe that could be a different talk for a different day, but I'll show you um, at the very end, I have a picture of uh, a metal printed uh, part that I centered. And this hasn't been centered yet, but I'm, you know, in a couple of days, I'm going to throw this into the oven and try to get this solid copper co uh, part. And then I'm going to go to an ancient uh, Roman burial ground and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to uh, bury, bury this in a hole somewhere and really try to confuse the archaeologists. So we pretty much finished the, um, the scanning part of the talk and I'm really ahead of schedule. I, it's been 31 minutes. We'll definitely finish uh, before the hour. Um, but here I'm showing you, you can use one of these setups to do active machine vision too. So this is a Windows connected setup. Um, and all I'm doing is I'm actually looking for the color of this little cake that's in this ant's mouth. And I'm following it around as it moves on my build plate. So I'm not following the ant, I'm just following the cake. Um, but you can do this in real time. Um, you know, so I think there's actually a lot of applications for this type of thing too. But really what I would like to do is I would like to make a product um, where you can take this and put it on a sidewalk and it would like follow bugs around whenever it, you know, it, it crossed its path. I'm sure there's probably a good use for this for, you know, for agriculture or entomologists, but I just really wanted to follow this bug around. And it could probably use like a PID loop or, or something to uh, stabilize this footage. It's not great. Uh, this is just kind of a little project I did in the span of an afternoon. Uh, once you have a motor, a camera and a, uh, digital, and a digital microscope and a 3D printer, this is actually, uh, this rig was actually kind, kindly donated by DinoLite Digital Microscopes. Um, a representative saw my, uh, you know, my project that I was using with a really cheap microscope. And they said, we'd like to see what you could do with a, a fancier one. So I'm really grateful for them uh, for giving that to me. Um, and here I'm just showing you um, just one of the applications you can do with a system like this. Here I have a PCB board. This is actually the board for the microscope. And I'm just, I put in the centroid file. So the place, places where all the parts are supposed to go. And I'm just, you know, going to each of those, I'm following a traveling salesman algorithm to efficiently go through the path. And I'm just going to each of those locations, taking a picture, and this would really simplify, you know, an inspection process. So there's really a lot of different things you can do. Once you have a camera attached to a, a rig like this, there's so much stuff you could do, you just have to add software. And it's kind of funny, actually, when I started with this, uh, the whole project was really about the hardware 
So getting the Blu-ray players and, you know, making it into a motorized rig in the first place. And then now increasingly, especially as I work mostly from home um, and I have to have something that's like, you know, a little easier to use. So um, I have this commercial system. Um, my, my work has really gone towards more uh, the software side of things. So actually programming everything as opposed to uh, making new hardware from scratch. So this whole project, this uh, the beefy version of the Ladybug scanner, um, this whole project is also available on Hackaday. Um, when I took this, I think it was 33 logs. Now there's about 40. So there's um, a lot of uh, information available here, a lot of information on how to use it, on the software, about my uh, trials and my triumphs and my failures, lots of failures. Um, and then, you know, plenty of pictures as well. So if you type in Hackaday, uh, ladybug beefy or hackaday scanner um, you'll probably find this in not too much time there's my name right there um, and you should probably never actually put here's a scan of fifty dollar bill you can't counterfeit with this because it's got a lot of distortions in it on purpose um, but probably you shouldn't be putting money in as your uh, as your background but go here if you want to learn more about this this project and how to actually build it and then finally, here are some uh, you know small variations of the same basic idea of using a camera and a um, imaging system to scan objects. Uh, here I have a um, dissecting microscope. It's right next to me. Um, I have a dissecting microscope and this rig with these stepper motors, and I'm controlling this um, attachment piece to move a petri dish. And this is this I didn't use for scanning. I just used this. I had a joystick that I could just move the the whole thing around. Um, but it just goes to show you that you know with a couple of motors you can really um, augment your existing hardware um, and modify to add a lot of functionality. So if you were to buy this from like Thor Labs or something, it would cost you probably like eight thousand um, dollars. And then here I'm just using some plastic, a couple of motors, and then actually. Um, uh, I'm actually controlling this part of the stage. This, um, this metal part is actually from a screwdriver set so that you can screwdrive around corners. I just hooked it up to the motor and hooked it up to the stage and it works great. Uh, here's a second variation of the same basic idea. So this is also actually made out of Blu-ray players and I called this the platform version. And it's just like the original version, which has four motors. Uh, so you got the X, Y, Z, and then rotational control. But in this case, all of the motors are on the same block. So rather than using this digital microscope, this actually just clips in here. And then rather than using this digital microscope, if you want, you can just bring your own camera. So if you're a photographer or, mic or a microscopist, you probably have uh, lots and lots and lots of really expensive hardware you've already paid for, good imaging hardware. And the idea with this is that you can just plonk it underneath and program it uh, just the same way you would um, with the, um, the original setup, but you can use your own camera or microscope. All of this, by the way, was a, a Kickstarter I, I launched in uh, July. Um, I really wanted to try and make all of this into a commercial product. Unfortunately, I didn't reach my funding goal, but I'm considering uh, launching again now that I've uh, you know, improved on it and learned a little bit about where my customers are. And then here's the final variation of, uh, of this project is to use the original Blu-ray optics to do imaging. So what I showed you, I mostly didn't use the Blu-ray optics. I used the motors. Um, and then I also use the laser for backlight, as you can see in this preview image, you know, I'm shining light through um, this optical pickup unit and I'm illuminating my sample. Uh, but I haven't actually been using them for imaging. And that was the original goal of the project because the operation of a disk drive is actually almost identical to a scanning confocal microscope. The only difference is um, one of these pickup units costs 250. And like the one at my school, the, the full size microscope costs 250, except the one at my school costs 
and then this one costs two dollars and fifty cents. And so, you know, here's a piece of this video um, showing you some of the work I've done. Or you know what? Actually, we have time. I'll just show the whole video. It's two minutes long. So this just shows some of the work I've done um, hacking these disk drives for imaging. So I'll let you watch this one. So this is the objective lens um, that focuses on the disc and it's controlled by a voice coil motor with nanometer level precision. Here I'm driving it. Um, I'm pretending it actually it's a speaker. Here I'm showing you can remove this objective lens and put in like a new stage if you want. An early attempt to use this objective lens and this these voice coils. And then a later one where I uh, stuck these lenses onto a smartphone. So you can use your smartphone and you actually have motorized positioning that way. And then just a quick proof of concept showing, you know, focus control and uh, sideways motion. This is all being controlled through the voice coils. And you have a distortion because it's normally meant for pinpoint imaging. And then here we get to the point where I said I removed the lens from the motor and I'm moving up and down. So we can watch this one again, I guess. Using the original laser as the backlight. And a lot of these results are kind of still raw. They're really meant more as a proof of concepts uh, than anything else. So I didn't show these because the, the results aren't really as good as the camera images I've shown you, but um, you know, it's worth showing, I think. So here I replaced the original photodiode assembly with a, a single photodiode uh, to make uh, you know, connecting to it a little bit easier. And then I'm using actually, this is the same rig, the same construction as the original scanner, um, you know, with these, uh, these Blu-ray drives moving a sample and then moving uh, a camera, but in this case, instead of a camera, I'm moving the original, this is the original Blu-ray assembly that I'm scanning uh, this piece of paper with. And then here we have, you know, an example result of that scan. It's not stellar, but it does, you know, reflect the original objects, uh, um, you know, shape. And then, you know, here's a PCB I made for this and showing you, you know, kind of a little idea of what it looks like when I'm working on this, you know, with my oscilloscope and with my PCB and everything. All right. And that's actually it. That's all I have. Um, there's plenty more pictures that I, I have that I'd be happy to show you um, online. Uh, plenty more things to show. Um, this is, I said, I've been, I've been working on 3D printing metal. Um, I actually got it to work for the first time in the past couple of days. Here's my head. So that's a little copper head that's 3D printed of me. Uh, here's like a little eye beam. And this is all 3D printed on a conventional 3D printer and then centered in uh, a conventional oven meant for ceramics. And then what I'm showing you here is the surface of my first attempt, actually my fifth attempt, but my first attempt that produced metal. And that's this little part right here. Um, and this is showing you kind of the structure of the, of the centered metal um, afterwards. And so with that, um, you know, I want to say thanks to you know, everybody at LTU, especially for you know, supporting me um, during this research. There's a lot of other people that I would thank. Uh, if they were here, I would single them out personally, but otherwise just blanket thank you. And I will open up uh, for questions. Um, I hope I wasn't muted, muted for the last 45 minutes. So we do have a couple of questions in the chat. Right. Um, the first one is um, from Jocelyn. What is the optical resolution that you're able to achieve? So that's always a, a sticky question for anybody who does um, macro or microscopy. Because if you look at you know, the specs for one of these microscopes, they'll say something ridiculous, like it has a thousand X resolution. And for digital uh, microscopy, um, the X resolution is basically how big you can get it on your monitor. 
which is kind of nonsense. Um, but I'd say you can distinguish features that are about five microns. Um, and then the resolution of, for instance, this coin that I scanned, um, this one, the, the, the per pixel resolution is about three microns. So more, maybe more mesoscopy than microscopy. Great. And then the second question is, how quickly can you acquire one of those images, e.g. the Roman coin? Is this technique feasible for close to real-time applications? So you could update the hardware to be close to real-time. Um, and so what I mean by that is if you had a wider imaging camera and then you had um, maybe a faster, uh, a faster motion system, you could, I take about five images per second. Okay, so I take about five images per second, but this scan with like 10 Z heights and a thousand images is like 10,000 pictures. So you're thinking more of like, um, you know, scans are like five minutes long and then a long one might be an hour long. And then if you're rotating, it can be several hours, so they can be quite long. Um, but this can be improved, I think, by about a factor of 10 or more, especially if you do pre-processing to figure out where you want to scan. So if you think about it, um, a scan like, that's what's a good example. So like, let's say a, a scan like, da, 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 da. here, how about this one? So a scan like this one, it's got bumpy areas, it's got smooth areas. And so what I've been working on is taking a picture of the whole object with um, a low magnification, and then doing a very quick scan under a low magnification and then forming a crude depth map of the whole object. And then when you do your high magnification scan, you can target only the parts that are actually you know, useful to look at. So if you have an object that's like shaped like this, you would only scan like this as opposed to for each thing doing a bunch of stacks. Um, and then most of that you have to throw away. So I think you could probably get it to real time um, with a couple of upgrades, but right now it's more like, you know, five minutes of scan, 20 minutes of scan, something like that. But it is all automatic. So you can put a bunch of things on a build plate and then you can scan them sequentially and it'll do all the scans automatically like overnight. Good questions. Um, it looks like our last question is coming up, but if anyone has any more, we've got a couple more minutes. So just write it in. Yeah. Um, we had a viewer ask if this will be posted for later viewing. Yes, yeah. it'll be posted under our archive. And then I believe, Aaron, you have a website with most of this information mm -hmm. and tutorial listed, yep, right? Yep, yep. So um, my website is just my name. So I was very lucky that my name makes no sense. So it's easy to get an up a website for it. So uh, ourownlean.com. And then this is also my contact info, uh, info at gmail.com. So if you go here, you'll get to a website where you um, have links to a lot of the pictures I've taken, uh, the project pages, the instructable guide, um, 3D model files, uh, my GitHub page, and so on. Uh, can we open up the questions to anybody who wants to, um, are they allowed to like share their video and ask a question? I'm happy no, to so have like a discussion. That's limited just to us. Oh man, yeah. come on. Um, the next question is by JD and he asks, what's your next metal 3D print? Oh, hi, JD. Um, so my next metal 3D print is going to be, I'm still working on calibrating this. Uh, so I'd like to do some circles um, and some structural components. Um, so like, for instance, a dog bone, I'd like to make dog bones um, at uh, different centered temperatures and then pull them apart and compare like, you know, their, their failure strength. Um, and then I'd like to make some biomedical things. So like uh, teeth, uh, brackets, end effectors for sur surgical robots. Uh, and then I'd also like to actually center this part. So I have this, um, this coin. Oh, hey. Da, 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 da. So this, uh, this coin that I just showed, I printed this out and I'd like to center this and again, bury it in, in a Roman uh, archeological site. Okay, um, so if anyone has any further questions that we didn't get yeah. to, or if you have any questions later, oh, we've oh, got one oh. more. Yeah, I, and I'm going to wait for a few more minutes anyway after that too. So have you ever considered commercialization for low tech labs, similar to Foldscope, aka $1 microscope? Uh, the answer is yes. I actually do have a Foldscope and I hate it. 
Um, no offense to anybody who has a cold scope, but it's like impossible to use. Uh, and I do really think that there is a lot of potential for like the cheap market um, because like the Blu-ray player version, especially, right? Uh, you can make the whole thing for like 20 bucks. So I think really for sure, like low resource uh, places, I'm really hoping that someone eventually decides to make this in one of those environments. I like the idea of people like in Brazil, you know, scanning insects, like kids doing that and then discovering a new species. Um, but when I launched, actually, when I tried to commercialize this, when I had my Kickstarter, I actually found that I had more interest in the expensive versions than the cheap versions. And I think the reason for that is because anybody who's enthusiastic enough about this wants the best thing rather than, you know, trying to save a couple hundred bucks. They're used to spending like $5,000 on a microscope or even just a lens. And so they'd actually want the best thing. But I do think it should absolutely be in low research environments. Uh, have you ever thought of using your tools for histology slide imaging? Absolutely, I've done that. Um, I can share a picture if you want. Um, this first, I, very early on, I have this slide holder. So this is a slide holder. And so absolutely, I've used this for, for whole slide imaging. There are lots of, um, slide imaging is actually kind of one of the easier things you can do because everything's flat. Um, and there are lots of slide imaging um, platforms already out there because it's just such a common problem. You can, you can buy commercial systems for this very easily. But I have, I've done, yeah. And your anagrams, that's a lot like, you know, like a, you know, like a gram stain. So, you know, good, good name if you're gonna be doing uh, slide imaging, just a joke. <laughs> And I'll happily wait here for a couple of awkward minutes for more questions. You're and welcome. And if anyone thinks of any last minute questions or is watching after the fact when it's archived, you can send um, anyone at BMES an email or you can send Aron an email. Um, we'll have his contact information posted under the archive. And um, yeah, this has been a very informative talk. So I can't hear clapping from anybody. They're not allowed to uh, share their screen because you know when I teach, I, I always make them clap at the end, right? Not too bad. If everyone could choose watching, could just type in the chat clap, uh, that would make me feel really good. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Clap, this clap, clap. You're welcome. A very supportive audience. Right. Um, so I think let's go ahead and wrap it up just a little bit early. Um, again, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and contact one of us. Otherwise, thank you for our presenter and for our audience. Um, have a great day. And don't forget to subscribe to me on YouTube. Yes, he has a YouTube channel. Check out his website as well. It's amazing. Yeah, ourownwayne.com. Hey, thanks everyone. All right, take care.